Hergé's Adventures of Tintin, or Tintin if you want to pronounce it the French language way. It was a French animated series on television in the late 50s and early 60s. The series had a total of nine seasons and told the same types of adventure stories one would find in the popular Belgian comic series of the same name. The series differs greatly from its first two seasons to its final seven, with the first two seasons being in black and white and using cruder animation techniques like paper cutouts, which was uncommon in the animation industry save for a few stylized projects. The low budget nature was such that only one voice actor voiced all the characters in the first season. Studios traded off after the second season, and past that point in time, the first two seasons have pretty much been an afterthought. Only one full episode from the first two seasons is found today, with no clips from any other episodes in that span being available. Okochi Gengoro Ika. Gosh, what is it with the foreign language words in this video? Anyway, this game was an unreleased Japanese game for the Nintendo 64. It features a young boy in the 5th grade with the player playing through 12 different scenarios dealing with his family. The game takes place during the reign of Emperor Hirohito, hopefully after World War II, and has a uniquely 20th century Japanese atmosphere. Each scenario starts out with a short introduction, after which the player must control his own actions to change the emotions of his different family members, and the scenario ends with the family discussing the events that just happened. It's unknown what company developed this game. One of the programmers is known, as he worked on Gale Racer for the Sega Saturn, but during this time the game was being produced, the public had no idea because no information was available. People only found out about this in 2007, about a decade after it would have released. Right now, no copies or materials are publicly available, but there are quite a few screenshots that have been floated around on the internet. Chain Reaction, where one word leads to another. With today's special guest stars, Joanne Worley, Steve Keneally, Sharon Spellman, Sal Viscuso, and the star of Chain Reaction, Bill Cullen. Chain Reaction. Chain Reaction was a game show that aired on NBC for five months in 1980 and then pretty much faded. Somehow, there were no less than three revivals of this game show on the Game Show Network, at least that I can think of off the top of my head. And those revivals ended up being more well known than the original show, which is quite rare. How the show worked is that players would be given a list of blanks, bookended by two words revealed to the player, and then they would have to fill in those blanks, though each consecutive word pair was a popular expression or idiom, so it wasn't complete guesswork. The original version was a bit different to the revivals, such as having a celebrity on each team, but generally, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. Most of the episodes of the 1980 version are lost, with a few episodes here and there available to watch. And it's weird to say that, because it's not like this game show didn't get rerun a lot after it ended. It's strange. Girl Crazy this was a low-budget romantic comedy that was completed in 1994, but didn't air on HBO until 1997. And when I say low-budget, I mean low-budget. This film was made with only $55,000. The creator and star of the film, Richard Dutcher, admits that it wasn't very good, but considering the legacy this film has, it's weird that it's not talked about more. Richard Dutcher himself was a Mormon, and this film, beginning his filmmaking career, helped spawn the phenomenon of Mormon cinema, which is an interesting rabbit hole in and of itself. The film has kind of a bare-bones plot about a man who learns it's better to be committed to one woman than to sleep around. Since it's 1997 showing on HBO Cinemax, not much of the film has been seen, with Dutcher claiming he wants to release a film on DVD to show aspiring filmmakers what not to do, and planned to do so in either 2008 or 2009, which obviously didn't happen. There was a private screening of the film held by Dutcher in 2017 as part of a film class he held, but there has been no public release of the film. There's no footage of the film available as of today. Track Rats Sea and Real is considered a dark era in Cartoon Network history, and with that, there have been a few unsuccessful shows that did not get preserved. 
While Track Rats is one of those shows, it's not the first one I've talked about, as I've talked about Bobby Says all the way back in the very first episode of this series. Track Rats in particular, however, is about amateur car racers trying to become NASCAR racers. Essentially, three competitors do various challenges, and the winner becomes a part of NASCAR according to description. It's unclear in what capacity that happens, though. Each episode of the series is only two minutes long, and was aired between commercial breaks. There were only five episodes as well, so all of those facts combined mean this should be one of the easiest series to find since it's only 10 minutes of footage. But no footage from anything besides a 36 second trailer is found. Monkey Island 2 Lost Content Developed as a sequel to the 1990 game Secret of Monkey Island, this 1991 Lucasfilm game is about the young pirate Guybrush, once again on a quest to defeat the this-time-resurrected Captain LeChuck. This point-and-click adventure game had quite a bit of cut content that never made it in, to meet storage space demands. This was in the era of floppy disks, after all. Most deleted content from the game was made available in the 2010 Deluxe Edition re-release, except one cutscene, which has been left out of all versions of the game. In that scene, a character witnesses the explosion of LeChuck's fortress, and then drops his monocle in the water, where he doesn't get it back. No screenshots or partial footage of that scene has been made available, and it's believed that the developers thought it was too dark to add to the game. And apparently the first game also has some cut content, so if you want to see me talk about that in a future video, let me know. Lord of the Rings Radio Broadcast in 1955, the BBC broadcast a radio dramatization of the Lord of the Rings novels. Now, similar things were done after this, but I'm specifically talking about the 1955 BBC version. And yes, youngins, Lord of the Rings was popular well before the Peter Jackson films came out. There were actually story changes from the Tolkien books to this radio dramatization, which is actually quite rare in most adaptations. Those were rather small, but what's generally known is that the story was quite rushed, since they only had six episodes to work with. Tolkien himself did not approve of the radio drama, calling it a silification. So with all that working against it, the Lord of the Rings radio drama, combined with being owned by the BBC who was notorious for not preserving tapes at the time, is now lost. Don Bluth's Ice Age The Ice Age films were an iconic series from the 2000s, whether you liked them or not. But there's a possibility they could have turned out very differently, and that they began with a different concept. There's no outright proof of this, but it's believed that Don Bluth, of Space Ace and Dragon's Lair fame, was originally going to be given the reins to Ice Age, but he turned down the offer. But if this were true, wouldn't this decision be made before production began? Well, not exactly. It's alleged that he and Gary Goldman agreed to work on Ice Age and had begun parts of production, but after Titan AE bombed at the box office, they left the project, and that lined up with Fox Animation Studio closing. There has been some alleged concept art of the more dramatic John Bluth take, but it's not verified as to whether or not it's real. I overshot. The ideal spot was that yellow mark, I think. I'm gonna have to get out of the rough. Wii Sports Prototypes At E3 2006, Wii Sports was shown off as nothing more than a tech demo. Through this demo, players could play the minigames baseball, tennis, golf, and airplane. The last one didn't end up in the game, but it was instead included in Wii Sports Resort. Obviously, the other three weren't the only games that ended up in the final version of Wii Sports, but they were perhaps the most well-known ones. Even through the little footage of the demo that's been seen, there's some aesthetic differences between it and the final game. Obviously this demo hasn't been released to the public and most likely never will, as it was never intended to. Though there is some video footage and screenshots available. There's even screenshots of the bowling game from an earlier prototype of Wii Sports that shows what the game looked like in a very primitive stage. The back rooms. From being a creepypasta to getting morphed into some meme like pop culture phenomenon, the back rooms images have been iconic on the internet for quite some time. 
although the origins of those images have been a mystery for quite some time as well. For the uninitiated, The Backrooms was essentially an internet horror story about a labyrinth that can trap someone forever with its monotonous rooms. The term liminal space often gets thrown around, and if you've ever wondered what it meant, it's basically the photo you see on your screen right now. These photos were recently discovered to come from a Wayback Machine archive of a hobby store's website where they were promoting the site of their new RC car racetrack. That store was a store in Wisconsin that to this day, two decades later, still has an awesome RC racetrack setup. So yeah, if you've ever wondered where those images came from, that's the story. It's in Wisconsin. Because the entire Midwest is basically just one big liminal space anyway.